Hello and welcome to day two and our sixth and final session of our second Amakitia Clarinet Extravaganza Weekend, this one entitled Back to Basics. We are so excited to join our two guest panelists, Kristen Denny Chambers and Paula Corley, to talk about important tips and tools to use when teaching the young clarinetist. We hope that band directors and private instructors will enjoy this informal discussion. So please be sure to write any questions that you may have into the chat, either here on Zoom or on Facebook Live, and we'll do our best to answer them throughout the session. So let's meet our panelists. Founder of Clarinet Playground, a website and community for clarinet related tips and resources, Dr. Kristen Denny Chambers enjoys teaching, playing, and writing fun music and studies for the developing clarinetist. To ensure that clarinetists of all abilities and backgrounds feel comfortable and included, Kristen's motto for Clarinet Playground is everyone invited. Dr. Diddy Chambers holds a Bachelor of Music Education degree from the University of Tulsa and Clarinet Performance and Pedagogy degrees from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and the University of Colorado Boulder. And our second guest panelist is Paula Corley. And Paula is a clarinetist and music educator with 40 years of teaching and performing, performing experience. She's the author of So You Want to Play the Clarinet and the author of The Break and is the mayor of Clarinet City. She's got a badge and everything. Um, and that's a, that's a clarinet teaching website. And Paula is also the clarinet instructor at Texas Lutheran University. So welcome both of you. And Denise and I are super excited to join in on the discussion today about teaching the developing clarinetist. But first I thought, you know, it'd be really interesting to talk with both Paula and Kristen about their special educational resources they've created for the young clarinet student. So Paula, let's start with you. Can you talk to us about your Clarinet City website and the resources that teachers and students can find there and about some of the videos you've made? Sure. Um, Clarinet City has got a lot of stuff. I think that you would find at least one thing that might be helpful there. Um, I have a lot of videos. I think there are probably 39. And I was very fortunate. Um, those were done in a recording studio actually in Paris. Um, the buffet company flew me there to do the videos um, and they're all posted there. So they're on a variety of different topics, uh, but they really center on beginning and intermediate. And then there are some advanced, but mostly beginner and intermediate. Um, I've written more than one article, everybody will laugh. So I'm sure because, and most of them are there. Um, there are links to uh, several of them that are posted online in other places. Um, and then there are some free PDFs that you can download. So there's really something for everybody. But what has driven my pedagogy is that I grew up in a very small town um, with no access to clarinet lessons. And I loved the clarinet. Um, so consequently, as you might imagine, I learned a lot of things wrong. <laughs> and I have really kind of dedicated my career to researching how we learn, um, when we need to learn it, and how to develop good skills on clarinet. So everything pretty much that I have there on the site reflects that. That's great. That's great. Kristen, can you talk to us about your play, your clarinet play, playground series? It's been a long day, sorry. <laughs> and the wonderful books that you've created. Thank you so much. First of all, I'll say I'm really excited to be included with this panel. And Paula, I mean, you're an, a hero to me. So it's uh, it's funny to be in this mixed company. That's um, great. <laughs> But I, my venture is still fairly new. Um, just four years ago, I wrote Prep Steps Before You Crepsh. Uh, the Crepsh studies were a huge jump for me um, coming from my undergrad into my master's study. I studied with Diane and she assigned, I think two keys the first lesson and I about had a cow because it was a lot harder than I was uh, used to. So that was a big jump for me and I really enjoyed them once I got into them, but then I started to think, and you know, there's got to be some kind of like in between, some kind of step that you can do before you dive into that. So that's kind of how that book came to be. Um, and then uh, Finger Fitness Etudes, which is kind of my, my big thing right now, is all about training fingers, moving one little thing at a time, but 
not just doing that, putting it into a piece of music that's really fun to play. So that's kind of the whole idea with Clarinet Playground and anything that I'm uh, writing or producing from now on is going to go with that mission of it's going to be fun, but it's also going to really work on something on the fundamental level. That's fantastic. <laughs> uh, we wanted to share too that we have a, a pedagogical video series on our Amakitia Duo website that's called the Play Pretty series. And there's something there for young players and for band directors as well. So we hope people they are looking for information can check those out too. But so much great combined knowledge here. So let's kind of dig into the conversation, Diane. Yeah, um, so uh, what do you consider to be the most important first steps when starting working with a young clarinetist? Uh, Paula, why don't you take that to start? <laughs> I'm going to follow your lead. <laughs> One of the things I think that uh, people forget about, and I know the band directors know this, but when you are screening students for instruments, um, there are some things that you want to look for on clarinet players. I think one of the most frustrating things, I don't see this very often, but sometimes young students will have really small fingertips. And I have seen, oh, I'm going to play, the kids can make a great sound on, on the barrel and mouthpiece, but they can't cover the holes. So um, there are some people who start kids on C clarinets um, and different clarinets. But I would say when you're, when you're doing the screening process, notice those things. Almost anything else will go. The hands are, are a big deal. Um, it has nothing to do with lip size or lip thickness or, or anything like that. I think um, if the student can, and we'll talk about that in a minute when we do embouchure, but if the student can make a good sound on the barrel and mouthpiece and, and it's pretty easy for them to blow, um, then the clarinet is, is not that scary of an instrument. You know, I think it works for a lot of people, not everybody, but I do think it works for a lot of people. But again, looking at the physical things, I have some uh, uh, thing, uh, stuff on my site that shows, and also in the book, um, it shows things that you should look for, other things like hands, um, and there's some pictures in there. Uh, you know, there are guys, for instance, young men who might come and say, I want to play the clarinet, and maybe they have large hands, and maybe their fingers are so close together because they're large that they can't cover the holes, they squeak a lot. So um, just do really good screening when you're looking for young students, do really good screening. Yeah, the screening thing is, is tricky because um, students always have in mind what they want to play when they come in to do that stuff. Um, and you want to help them get the instrument that they want. And then as a band director, you're also trying to fill your band so that you have the right ensemble. So it's a very tricky game. Um, but one thing that I encountered, um, you know, a student was fitted to a clarinet at the music store and they were like, okay, you can play the clarinet. They, they made sure the fingers covered and, and everything. But what they failed to do was like, okay, now put it this way. And then once it was to the mouth, her fingers couldn't cover at all. So, you know, make sure you do that too, all the way to the mouth and then check to see that fingers are able to reach everything. I think that you guys reminded me of an experience I had when I was um, at North Texas doing my master's and I was teaching a summer camp and this little girl, you know, came up and she, her fingers literally went, her lower hand, the lower joint went inside the tone holes. She's a little fifth grader, sixth grader, you know, and I think I wish so much that her band director had let her wait to grow up a little bit more so she'd be successful, but instead she was in tears because she couldn't play anything. She just wasn't physically ready to play the instrument. So it's kind of another good offshoot. When do you guys like to start beginners? How, okay. how early is too early? I'm sorry, what, what was that? So how, what age group do you want to start beginners? You know, that, that's a really good question. Um, Catherine Cook, or Lowenstern, teaches in a school in New York City where they start kids really, really young. Um, and she's had great success doing that. Um, because I'm a product of public schools, um, and even when I started, um, I started in fifth grade. Um, and now most people start around fifth or sixth grade. However, you know, with Catherine, she, like I said, she starts kids way younger than that. And then I'm sure if we talked to some of the world's greatest players, we would probably find 
several of them who started when they were like seven years old. I've heard that before. Um, and I would say if you do that, um, you're, you're going to really need access to a teacher um, for the student because I think that, again, there's so many things to consider besides physical aspects um, where they are maturity wise. You know, there might be some kids that that could really thrive, you know, with private lessons at that age. But um, I think it's it's very it would depend on the student and it's probably very subjective. You know, you have to really look at a lot of things. Yeah, I'd like to, you know, I think that's exactly right. Is I'm not sure there's the right age. You know, I started the summer before my fourth grade. I, I was eight, I think. Mm -hmm. And that's just because my older sister was involved in summer band and they put an instrument in my mouth. And mm -hmm. clarinet, I could get a sound out of. I was really good at recorder all of those years prior. And my band director's wife was a clarinetist. So, you know, I was able to, to study with her and I know that helped you know, taking lessons right away because yeah, my fingers were so tiny and I could barely, you know, cover the tone holes, but at least she was able to help me still get around and not squeak too much, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so I think it's, it just depends, but I do think, you know, finding a teacher right away is so important. I mean, the band director can't do everything, right? Right. <laughs> Good. All right. So can we, Diane, do you want to ask the next question? Uh, sure, sure. We're, we're, we're a little bit different and uh, you must not have the, the current script. But anyway, so uh, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and talk about uh, teaching embouchure. Okay, so, um, and quite frankly, you might, I don't know about you guys, but we, we have to talk about air at the same time, right? We actually have to talk a lot about, about a lot of different things, not just embouchure, right? But so feel free to just give, give in a nutshell how you would go uh, approach teaching embouchure. And also, what do you think about the importance of modeling good tone quality for young students? We'll kind of couple that together. Okay. Um, I can start on this one if you if you'd like. Um, I really like the analogy of the thick milkshake. So if you have a straw and you're drinking a thick milkshake, it immediately puts everything where it needs to go. And it's really easy for young students to grasp that concept instead of like feeding them all this extra information that they don't really need to know at the moment, you know? So just as simple as you can be, the thick milkshake, have them do it with their finger, and that just puts everything where it needs to go. It brings the corners in, it brings the chin down and flat. It makes sure that the lips aren't tucked in too far, which can happen a lot with, with when they're first starting. So that little milkshake thing is the, one of the easiest things that I do. And I'll even let them breathe through their nose as they're first learning to play so that they can maintain that. And then we learn about like, you know, releasing the corners and then coming back to form the embouchure. I try to keep it as simple as possible when they're first starting because they have so many other things that they're trying to think about. Um, but I do the milkshake thing and then after a week or so of that, then I introduce teeth on top in combination with that milkshake. Now, when you're in a band setting, things are a little bit different, but if you have a homogeneous beginning class, like all your clarinets are in one class, you can get away with lots of things. But if you're teaching and you've got trumpets and you've got your percussion, they're all in the same room, it's a little bit trickier to navigate all these things. So you may skip a step here and there, but if you have a chance to either meet with your clarinets individually, or they do a little group after school one, one day uh, during a week, then you can do these little tricks with them. Absolutely. I agree with that. The, my a beginner book that's been out, Kristen has got the, the first edition, which is hysterical, on the stand. That's so funny, that first edition, that it was read in the spotlight. That's great. I could talk new stories. Here's what it looks like now. And it's published by uh, Southern Music. It's distributed by Hal Leonard, so everybody can find it. Okay, so in that book, what I had to come up with, um, I did exactly what Kristen had just said. Um, I, in Plano ISD, I taught large groups of beginner clarinets, and I would have anywhere from, say, 10 or 12 to 40 in a class of people just playing clarinets. So I had to come up with a way to teach embouchure pretty quickly to a lot of people. 
Um, and also I use this for testing. So I have a little five-step process. So I'm gonna share my screen um, and I'm gonna see if I can get this to come up so you guys can see this. Okay, and this is um, a student in my Woodwind Methods class in, uh, from TLU. And um, we're gonna go through the process so you can hear me actually explain it. Um, and it can be done fairly quickly. And I agree with Kristen, they have a lot of things to think about. So you don't want to get too detailed because it will not be perfect. <laughs> you know, the first time they try, it's not gonna be perfect. I hope the sound, you guys can hear this. Straight ahead for me, please. Okay, open your mouth. Okay, this mouthpiece is gonna go inside your mouth. Okay, so it's gonna feel a little weird at first like that. All right, yeah, drop your hands to your side. Okay, good, let's do that again. So open your mouth, just like you're normally going to like just put a, a fork with food in your mouth open. Now I'm gonna rest this reed against your bottom lip. Put your top teeth on the mouthpiece. Okay, good. Now we're gonna take it one step further and add something, another, another aspect to it. Okay, hands down, good, open. Okay, now I'm gonna rest the reed against your bottom lip. Top teeth on the mouthpiece. Close your lips and blow. Thank you. Okay, so that pretty much is the um, tone that I would want, you know, to start with for our very first sound because I try to get to uh, approximate an F sharp on the barrel and mouthpiece. Um, Andrea is a flute player, surprise, surprise, right? Okay, and so there were some things that were not perfect. Her bottom lip was rolled out and so forth. But um, you can get the embouchure explanation down to something like Kristen said, really simple. I do the five steps and then you refine it um, as you go along because it's not going to be perfect right when they start. Um, and air, we mentioned air. Um, I think that uh, when you tell students to put air through the horn, the biggest issue is to get them to actually put enough air through the horn at a fast speed. And so I would let the sound guide you like as close to an F sharp on the barrel and mouthpiece as possible. If it's lower and it's wobbly, um, then that's because they're not gripping the mouthpiece and maybe it's moving around inside their mouth. But I think as far as air is concerned, kids really don't know how much air it takes to make an instrument make a sound because the clarinet is a lot more resistant, I think, than the recorder, right, for instance. So it takes time and you just have to keep working, you know, faster air and faster air. Um, I have over the years experienced a lot of different scenarios where kids get real upset if you get real, and parents too, if you get really detailed about breathing and it must be this way and it must be this way. Because at the end of the day, we're all human. And as a pulmonary specialist told me once that I interviewed about breath, that I thought was very interesting, humans tend to breathe more deeply in the afternoon than they do in the morning. And that we all breathe from our diaphragm, that that is just the way humans are built. So, you know, we don't have to, we can show them where your diaphragm is, of course, but we don't have to get too detailed about that. So when you say, oh, they're breathing from the chest or, you know, no, the air's coming from the right place. The bottom line is they just need time to learn how much and how fast. And how about talk, you know, in terms of when do you talk about what's going on inside the mouth? How oh, that... it directs the air? <laughs> I mean, because of course that's part of the embouchure, right? Exactly. And in the videos on my site that I did for Buffet, there's a pretty detailed uh, explanation about, about barrel and mouthpiece. But I don't know how Kristen feels. I use an E tongue position. And so I start without tongue. I don't want the tongue to touch the reed when they start. So I start with he, so, and have them blow as fast air as they can and work on all of this, like she said, with the straw, work on all of that first, get the air going before you even start to talk about articulation. Yes, but I think a high tongue position, E is the best way. Yeah, I agree. I think E is the easiest sort of place to start with young people, you don't have to get into all the details of the E and the U and all of that that can come later. 
Um, but the easiest thing that I do physically is I say, put your hand under your jaw and say E and then say ah, and you can see that it moves your jaw. So hopefully they go E and blow with that E air and then everything stays stable. Okay. Denise, do you have anything you want to add to that? Um, I think, I mean, gosh, air is the, the biggest thing. That's the first way to get them. You know, I say my engage the cage, trying to get the students to really think about the speed of the air because they just don't realize it. They, tuba players understand we got to play with a lot of air, but clarinet players, we think, oh, it's this little instrument. It shouldn't take much. And I love seeing a student's face when they finally play with the right air and they hear the sound and it's all of a sudden, it's this aha moment. It's like, that's what we've been talking about all along. <laughs> but, <laughs> I said, I'm going to get the word air tattooed on my, my forehead for the love of God blow or something like that. <laughs> Put air in there. But yeah, just getting them to do that, I think is so important. Um, and I love, Diane's got a really great video where she talks about the embouchure and describes it in such detail. And that's something I think that's better for teachers. It's hard with the students because they're just excited about playing when they're young. They don't care about all of whatever. They just want to do it. And so I love that you guys are coming with really simple, clear things that people watching, that teachers watching can take to their students and form a proper embouchure, right? And then the check is reinforcing it to make sure that they're not starting to chomp down, keeping that space in the jaw, right? Yes. So, yes. So what I find unfortunate in most of the method books that are out there, you know, the beginning band method books are, you know, roll your bottom lip over your bottom teeth. Well, what does that mean? Right? <laughs> you know, and, and generally, there's too much lower lip rolled over the bottom teeth. So I love Paula what you demonstrated because you basically did it for them by putting the mouthpiece in the mouth. You know, what I like to describe is, is, uh, Smooth, smooth, uh, smooth mouth or spread. There we go. That's the word. See, I told you I had problems with words. <laughs> spread the lower lip across the front of the bottom teeth. And that right then and there gives you enough lower lip over the bottom teeth. But just using that kind of wording to me, I, I think is a good description for, for students. And I don't know if you guys uh, have tried this, but and of course, as students, you can talk about forming the embouchure and then they put the mouthpiece in their mouth and what happens? Well, then they do this, right? And everything everything changes. So um, sometimes I've done this where, you know, I explain the embouchure, I have them make the jaw opening, everything, and I have them start to blow a steady stream of air and then very carefully insert the mouthpiece reach, reed wedge into the mouth until they make a sound. And then they realize, wow, I don't actually have to change anything. And usually they're keeping everything nice and forward and pointed and all of that, rather than insert mouthpiece, then make the embouchure. No. Yeah. And I love that, Paula, in your, in your video, you demonstrated with just the barrel and mouthpiece, just like a brass player should start with the mouthpiece and practice buzzing. We need to, without worrying about trying to hold an instrument that feels foreign in any way, to be able to just focus on that most important part, the starting place with the embouchure, with just that barrel and mouthpiece. Really, Ab really helps. Absolutely. I, I would like to caution, if there are band directors wor uh, watching, um, something that happened many years ago, and there is still going on. But there are some uh, band directors, the kids, of course, are really excited and they want to play a song. Well, the, um, this one teacher that I came across was when I was doing, I, I don't know where it was, a presentation. She said, oh, you just moved too slow. She said, I can get my kids to play Joy to the World at the end of the first day. So she just said, da, 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 da. I was like, my head's going to explode, you know? And so you, you can, just can't do it. And you're going to spend a lot of time saying, be patient, be patient. Then if the kids are lucky enough to have a private instructor, then they can move faster. But you owe it to yourself in a class setting for sure to allow at least, I'd say, 75% mastery before moving on to something else. Or it's just going to be, well, when they start playing in, in an ensemble, it's going to be like earplugs. <laughs> Squeak city. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Speaking of earplugs, I just wanted to follow up with the with the last part of the question that Diane had, that Diane had asked about the importance of a, a tone model, uh, about the sound. How important to you is that in the beginning for students? Boy, I think tone quality is the most important part about playing an instrument. I talk about that all the time. Um, so if, if you're a director and you struggle with making a characteristic sound on the clarinet, 
have some recordings or have some videos or bring in like your best high school student to play for your young students. Um, if you have clarinet teachers in the area, see if you can invite them in to do a clinic with your students and be in the room for the clinic. I know that you're going to be tempted to want to go into your office and get some stuff done, um, but stay in that room and participate and get out of clarinet because if you can get better at it too, then you can teach it more effectively um, by being on the other end of the instrument. Absolutely. I love when the teachers stay in the room. Thank you. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, again, I was so lucky when I did the research for my books. I was just teaching just clarinet. It was an ideal job. I just went from campus to campus and started big classes of clarinet. Um, one of the students that I was lucky enough to have when I was doing this book, um, you may know this name is Todd Cope. Um, Todd is uh, the principal in Montreal now. And so he's very near and dear to my heart. And he reminded me the other day, he says he thinks that one of the reasons why he loved the clarinet so much and wanted to play in an orchestra is we had class in the cafeteria. Well, you could hear it all over the school, right? And so I would always get my horn out and play something, but most of, I must have played Mozart an awful lot. He said because he just remembers the third movement of the Mozart, and he said he would run to try to be the first one to get to the okay. stairs so he could hear most of it, you know, and, and that made me feel so good because, I mean, you don't even think about things like that. But absolutely, characteristic sounds, I agree with everything Kristen said you know, get a characteristic sound in their ears. Maybe too important. I know I like to, especially in the beginning, I kind of collect, collect all of my favorite recordings of the players that I just love their sound the most and, you know, create a CD or some kind of recording for students so that they've got it. They're not just going to go to YouTube and listen to little Jimmy play in church who might be wonderful, but when they could be listening to what we're, our goal is, that really beautiful warm sound, I think it's so important because as we all know, the sound is in their head. They might play different equipment or whatever, but they're going to get that sound that is the model that's in their head. And so we want to make sure it's a good one, whatever it is, right? Absolutely. Uh, all right. So another question, this one kind of dealing with developing technique. Um, how do teachers help students to develop technique while still maintaining that all important proper hand position? Because we get into the band, you know, bands where they're trying to get ready for contest, getting ready for a concert and the music faster, higher, louder, and the students are trying everything they can. And they develop a lot of bad habits doing that. How do we prevent that? Kristen, you want to go first? Sure. Um, when I'm thinking about the younger students, um, you know, this, this may contradict with Paula a little bit. We'll see what she says. <laughs> um, when I work with my younger students, I try to avoid having a book anywhere near them or a music stand anywhere near them because I kind of think of it like you're going over to someone's house and they've invited you for dinner. So you're in their house and you're very welcome in their living room and you feel like you can navigate the living room and have no issues. And that's kind of where we are with the clarinet like the left hand is like the living room, right? Like we're comfortable there in beginning band. We're going to be there for a long time, but that right hand can develop some really strange habits. If it's neglected, there are some people that teach um, upper joint only for a while and they have them hold up here on the barrel. That's one way to, to do that. Um, but something that I like to do is even on the first couple of days, I do encourage them to walk down. And we just start with thumb F and we walk down the instrument covering all the tone holes one at a time. We do it in front of a mirror. I have them face each other. They have buddies that watch each other like, oh, that finger missed. You know, you can get them involved where they're helping each other. That helps too. So I start with that walking down and then we get to where it's open G and walking down. And then we start to add one pinky note and the more coverage and better and good hand position they can get down here with this right hand, the easier it'll be when the time comes to start crossing the break. So we, that'll help develop that. Otherwise you might end up with some really strange habits when they're doing all of their twinkle, twinkle little star on the top hand. So that just, it's, it's sort of like giving the tour of the house when you go to the party. So take a little tour, you know, you kind of know where everything is, but we're gonna live here in this living room for a while when we work in the book. No, I think that's great. I, I agree with everything you said. I have two really specific things. Again, I'm coming at it from a little bit different perspective because I was starting huge classes of, of clarinet players. So one of my pet peeves is I'm with, I'll go a little further than Kristen, is I do not like um, the idea that people give the kids half the horn to play 
and then they have to earn the bottom joint. I'm sorry, you can say I said that. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so the very first, and kids like to play melodies, right? So I do start with hot cross buns, but I don't start on the E. I start with B flat, uh, D, C, B flat. Well, why do I do that? Because kids notoriously, if you keep them in the right hand, they're going to do this. They're going to hold the clarinet, the weight of the horn here. Okay. And it's just terrible for hand position. So I absolutely get down to B flat. The D, C, B flat are their first notes. Um, because it's really important that they are able to hold the horn. It's not going to be perfect, but it's going to be a heck of a lot better than just playing on one joint. The other thing that I'm really big on is an exercise called pinky finger gymnastics. And I don't want to play video uh, my videos here. You can go, I've got it pulled up, but you can go to my site um, and download it. Um, it. It explains that the pinky finger gymnastics, you have to take your time. You know, I'd say the kids can get down to low G without squeaking if they're practicing. If they have a private teacher, probably not, won't take very long. If you're in a class situation and you're a band director, it's going to take longer um, to get them down there. But what you want to do is when you get to low G, is you want to make sure that they can sustain low G and press every pinky key in the right hand and then the left hand while sustaining low G. That's hugely important. Um, in the break, I talk about that. That's my second intermediate book. I think it's extremely important. Why? Because if they cannot sustain G with good hand position, then you can forget going into the middle register and crossing the break. It's just not going to happen. So those are my two biggies. Start, get them down to B flat as quickly as you can. And then once you get to G, don't teach them a bunch of extra notes. Let them learn physically. It's like Kristen said, I love what she said, no music book in sight. You know, do it by ear. You, if you can't demonstrate, load up my video, you know, so, and you'll see it on there. So those are my two big things for hand position. Yeah, yeah I love that. I want to piggyback on that real quick because you do that little pinky gymnastics, which I call it pinky aerobics. It's the same, same idea. It's going to reveal things. If they're doing this with their hand, they're not going to be able to do that. So it's going to really help you diagnose some issues with their hand position. Yeah, I was just going to say so many students track that pinky up and mm -hmm. it's right up against that ring finger and they can't even feel the different pinky. Right. I call it a pinky dance. So we all have our own. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I think another good reason, um, you know, for starting with the entire instrument, because then when you get them the bottom, a lot of them will use that pinky underneath the bottom stack of keys, or like Diane saying, kind of the index finger goes into the bottom trill keys to support the weight of the instrument, right? So I think that goes along with waiting till they're physically ready to start holding the instrument and, and just constantly checking their hand position. Um, I know we're going to talk about some of these things in just a bit, but teaching class woodwinds, I talk about how important it is to not just look at the front of your clarinet players, but walk behind them too, see where their thumb is, making sure that their thumb is touching the very bottom of the register key and they're not having to jump up to it and uncover that F tone hole, but they're just pressing it. So they get in those proper hand positions. And um, I always love Diane says you play the clarinet from the knuckles down, right? So that we're getting them to think about that rather than you know, tensing up using their arms and, and everything else rather than just staying relaxed and keeping those fingers in place. And then the last thing I wanted to say about that is I, another part of this equation is band directors who are feeling the pressure to, to learn something really fast or get kids to go some, to do something really fast. And I would just encourage them that to some things take time to settle. It takes time to learn muscle, correct muscle movements and and all of that hand position, we've got to give them time to do that slow repetition before we start pushing them faster, or you're going to end up with students who are not going to proceed in their technique like they could have had they had more time to develop a really strong foundation first. And I know that's hard, having been a band director, it's hard to do that. Yeah. Okay, so so this is a good segue. We've already kind of segued into this, but we can probably expand upon this question. You know, what are some easy things to miss when teaching beginning clarinet in a band setting? We've already described some of them. I, I would also say the instrument themselves, right? I mean, so often, you know, little Susie has Aunt Betsy's clarinet that's been in a closet uh, for years and Aunt Betsy's clarinet is, isn't sealing. So what happens? 
little Susie squeezes and does horrible things. So, you know, that's one of the first and foremost things is you've got to make sure your students' instruments are actually working. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. You know, I think two of the things that are really easy to miss, especially in classes that have a lot of different instruments, um, is that students, after you've taught the embouchure, they do not have their teeth on the mouthpiece mm -hmm. and the mouthpiece is moving around inside the mouth and you you it's easy to miss um and then the other thing when you get to articulation it doesn't happen all the time but somebody didn't i've been told when i i did see this well the reed tickles my tongue they don't use their tongue to 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 actually articulate their breath tonguing and so that's not a good thing so those are the two things that you miss um, and speaking of embouchure grip, I don't know how you, you guys feel, but just a word about this, you may hear about this. There are um, some people who teach what we call double lip embouchure without the traditional grip on the mouthpiece. Um, and the only thing I would tell you about that is that I would highly suggest that the student, if they are playing with, if you teach double lip, that they have private lessons every week because the sound is not going to develop at the same rate as the traditional embouchure with the top teeth on the mouthpiece. So it's not that I think it's bad. I just think it's just, you're just going to have someone going to have to have somebody there because there, there are so many things about playing double lip that need reinforcement, you know, on a weekly basis. Whereas the traditional embouchure that I don't know, probably 95% of us use, um, is probably much easier to do and gives quicker results. Yeah, it's very hard to teach double lip, I think, in a group setting like that. Yeah, you really too. understand the embouchure before teaching it. It's very but true. But some kids gravitate towards that because mm -hmm. it, the, the teeth on the top tickle them. Mm -hmm. So what we can do is get those thin mouthpiece patches. And I always say the thin ones. I don't like the thick ones because I think that makes people bite uh, personally. So, um, but you know, that's something else that band directors can look at is getting those mouthpiece patches to help students not feel, you know, ooh, that's, that feels funny, <laughs> that vibration. Yeah, I like the mouthpiece patches for multiple reasons. The vibration on top of that, and it also kind of gives you something to kind of hold on to. I feel like when you just have the plain mouthpiece, your teeth can slip from side to side. And especially once you move things into the marching band realm, having that patch gives you something a little bit more to grip on when you're uh, moving and playing. I yeah. even know some people who put an extra patch that's cut further down where they want their students to have their teeth up against. Yeah. <laughs> so they learn how much mouthpiece to have in the mouth. So that's a fun little tool. Yeah. Yeah, check Tom Pawlowski's videos. He's got lots of stuff about that. He loves that. <laughs> oh. Okay, well, I'm trying to think of something. There was something else I was going to say, and I was listening to you guys, and it got derailed about, oh, the, the thumb rest on the instrument. That's another thing for band directors that, that we miss sometimes as teachers, especially if you don't get behind them and see what their hand looks like. And if you are fortunate enough, so many of the beginning horns these days come with adjustable thumb rests, which is fantastic. If you, they don't, you can have them replaced by someone who knows what they're doing. You don't want people just drilling into the wood of the instrument, make sure they know. But I, a good rule of thumb um, for, for our band directors out there, if you take, you have them hold their hand up and see where their thumb naturally places between their index and middle finger, and then turn the hand, that's where their thumb rest should be. And if the thumb rest is, as we all know, if, you, if it's just in the wrong place, even a little bit, you can end up with students with a lot of unnecessary pain, um, shooting up their thumb into their arm. So making sure you get that thumb rest from the very beginning in the proper place can really set them up for better hand position and much more comfortable playing. So watch for that. And that can change as they grow. So have them keep checking it every once in a while. <laughs> I'm glad that you mentioned that, Denise, because um, when we were talking about embouchure, one of the other things is um, students will set the embouchure and have everything look really good. And then they go to play and it's really loose. So I think about my right thumb pushing up against my top teeth. I call it thumbs up. And that helps to secure that wedge. And you can go around when you're just doing barrel and mouthpiece and, and do that wedge for them. Because if they're playing flat, that's probably what they need. Just like push it up into the, the wedge and so that they get a little bit of contact and then the pitch will probably go up. 
and always ask them before you do that. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, a lot of people will say the thumb or up and out so that you're, which I know we have to be careful about talking about the, the bottom thumb because if you push up too much, you're adding extra tension there, but it should be a good firm up and out thinking about pressure against that top lip. Top yeah. Tip. And you'll see it if your students are playing and their clarinets are wiggling a lot. So look for that. And then you know that they're just too loose at the embouchure and they don't have enough wedge going in. Yeah. Something I do in class woodwinds and with beginners is to tell them I'm going to do this. And then I just take their barrel and very gently move from side to side. And if it goes you know, with them, they know it's too loose. Yeah. They get too tight, the sound closes off. But trying to get them the idea, I say, I'm like a puppy with a sock. But while you're keeping it, <laughs> but so that you're not letting it move around like that right and then of course coupled you know now this is not when you're playing an open g but you know the left thumb you know really helps distribute the weight between the two hands so we're you know it's not just the right thumb that's responsible but it's that left thumb pressing up and out um, and, you know, we have that on the instrument 95% of the time. You know, one of our um, listeners says, what about, you know, do you recommend uh, young students getting a neck strap? What do you guys think about that? I, I play with a neck strap. Um, I, I mean, I've done it for years. I don't uh, have kids get neck straps to start. I think it's very personal. And if I see a need for one, like if somebody's really struggling with hand position and you've tried all the things that we've just talked about, that that might be the next step. Um, it might help. And I think for some people it works well, but I don't really push that because I think that, I think it's really personal um, and it depends on the player, um, whether or not they feel, so sometimes it helps, sometimes it gets in the way. Right. Yeah, I agree completely. <laughs> I wear a neck strap, um, but I think it's because I developed some bad habits when I was younger. And so I've had to compensate. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's just, you know, if, if, if I suggest a student try a neck strap and I, I, again, I wouldn't do this necessarily for a beginner, you know, I just make sure I say, don't use it as a replacement for good hand position and good holding of the instrument because that's not what it's there for. It doesn't replace holding the instrument with your thumbs, you know, up and out. And and I find I have caught students before with their right thumb like an inch below the thumb rest oh. when they're using a thumb, <laughs> you know, a neck strap. So that that's something to watch out for. Or stand without a thumb rest. Mm -hmm. It came off and they don't tell you about oh. it. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> I've seen that. Believe me, I have. I have. <laughs> All right. So let's let's kind of talk about equipment now. So how do teachers know when it's time to move on to new equipment and what should they listen and look for? What are some obvious things that will help them? That's a tricky one. I only have something short I would say about that. Um, you know, I have a student in this situation right now. She's an all state level player. Um, and she's playing on an inter intermediate instrument. And she has just reached the point to where she needs something with more flexibility. She needs something that's gonna help her level up. She's just sort of hitting a wall with what she has right now. So that's um, just like the next strap. It's also a very personal thing. It just kind of depends on where that student is. And if it just seems like they're not progressing, like what is it? Maybe it's equipment. Maybe we need an upgrade somewhere to help them progress to that next level. Yeah, I agree with that. I would say um, it's time when the student's work ethic is really strong. Um, and exactly what Kristen said, you feel like when you hear, the, hear them play that they may be struggling a little bit and ask them, you know, how it feels. So the first step would be if you have a pro model horn yourself, put their mouthpiece and on there and let them try it and ask them if it makes a difference, you know, because most pro model horns, the feel is just totally different you know, from the, the lesser priced ones that we start with. Um, and the other things I think to watch for, um, maybe they're having pitch problems. Maybe they have a really good focus sound, but as I've said many times, the clarinet is designed, uh, you know, the same way. I mean, they're all made basically very similarly, but there are a lot of differences um, in, in pitch. I don't know how to say this. Okay, so they, the, the pitch can come from mouthpiece needed to be replaced, but it can also come from the scale of the horn. The pro models you don't have to worry about, 
but the student models, without getting too detailed, not all of them are created equal. As my husband likes to say, not all scales are created equal. So some manufacturers um, don't take as much care when they machine make the lower price clarinets. So all that to say, if they're having pitch problems, that would be a sign, or having to work too hard to make the horn respond, uh, especially with technique and stuff like that. So it might be time, but I always like to have the kid try. I'll let him try my instrument. They'll go, wow, this is so easy. And I go, yeah, that's why I had it. Yeah, yeah. So, but work ethic. Yeah, it did work and that, out. You know, that's something even for beginners, you know, um, again, in our skills classes, we, we have them uh, start out with the stock mouthpiece that came with the intermediate model instrument. Um, and a regular ligature. And so, and I think around week three, we have them switch to, we have them switch to Brad Bain's overture uh, mouthpiece and an inverted ligature. And they're like, and they play and they're like, oh my gosh. And, and we do that on purpose because these are future band directors who are gonna be sending me students hopefully someday. And, you know, and I wanted them, I want them to realize that, yeah, a stock mouthpiece isn't necessarily what's going to be the best for your beginners. You want to give your beginners, they can have a beginning model clarinet that hopefully is in good condition, but a better quality mouthpiece than the stock mouthpiece and an inverted ligature, those two things I think need to happen right away, personally. I think a good mouth, I agree with you 100%. Um, mouthpieces, I get asked about this a lot, and this is going to kind of go to a question you're going to ask later, but I want everyone to know that if you had any of these ladies come in and play in your band hall and ask them what equipment they play, more than likely what they play is not going to be suitable for a beginner because they've had years and years of training and they've practiced like crazy and they're extremely accomplished players. So what works for them is not going to work for a young student. So I hear a lot of, oh, well, we're going to start on this mouthpiece because this person in this orchestra play this, plays this mouthpiece. Well, you got to think about so many things when you pick out a mouthpiece that we won't go into right now. So I would say, just suggest to you to get a good quality mouthpiece that's not a stock mouthpiece that's in the middle. Everything about it is medium. Medium facing, medium tip opening, that'll play with a three reed, um, I do think a good ligature is a good idea. I like the inverted ones. I play one myself. Um, they're much easier to deal with. Um, but as a word of caution, don't assume that you can put a professional mouthpiece that somebody plays that gets a great sound and your kid is going to sound great on it because chances are they won't. You have to get, you have, it's like training wheels on a bike. Very true goes back to that idea the sound is in the head. You can play exactly what Robert Marcel's played, but you're not going to sound exactly like him, Robert. Right? <laughs> and I think another good, you know, and I'm sure everybody who's listening to this will, will understand this, but I think parents, we have to educate the parents that, mm -hmm. you know, where you can buy a big block of cheese is not where you're going to buy a clarinet. You know, you, you don't, you know, you don't want to buy it from one of these warehouses. Um, and unfortunately, they'll sell instruments, right? So, so we, we, we have to educate, you know, that, that's our band, band director's job, our job as private instructors. Um, you know, and somebody asked, how do you go about talking to parents about getting your student a new clarinet? What resources can you give the parents to make their purchase affordable? Mm. Maybe we can answer that question for one of our guests oh there are a lot of um um retailers who are now offering financing mm -hmm. so if your child or your student is really ready for that next level um there are some companies that are even doing two years no interest so just do your homework and look into some of these places and you, you could make it happen affordably without having to just break your bank account immediately and then the student gets the benefit of using the instrument while you're paying it off in easy chunks. Yeah. I think that's excellent. I mean, I think that's really the bottom line is look for, ha ask the director, the band director, or, you know, they all deal with music stores. 
um, and got them to somebody that will, you know, let the kid, your student try everything that they have and not just push one brand over another. Um, and I do that same thing with my students. Well, what do you like? And have them try a bunch of different ones. Of course, I would guide them if they pick not a good instrument, um, but it's possible to step up and get good deals now. And I would think more so now than ever, um, it would be easier to do that. Um, but yeah, and I do want to say one thing, caution if there are any uh, people out there listening, picking a pro clarinet is, is not as simple as seeing one online. I'll give you an example. Um, there's uh, a student that I know that the grandfather wanted to do something really nice for her because she was coming to college. So he just ordered one from a, a store that really was not a clarinet store. Um, they had mostly other instruments. So lucky for us, it was a good instrument and solid and played well and so forth and so on. But when you are laying out money um, and lots of it, it's to some people for the, these instruments, it's always best to take an objective party with you you know, if you can take a teacher or somebody who plays the instrument that doesn't work for the music store, you know, that can go with you and give you an opinion, that would be ideal. Um, and very much so if you are looking at a used instrument from a private party. Yes, That's such good advice. I beg my students, do not surprise me. I came home to come back after Christmas and I've got a new clarinet. Oh, no. <laughs> so it really, really helps to have that. Um, perspective from someone who's played for a long time before they invest that money because once they've done it they've got it and then they're stuck with it in band exactly yeah. um i have one quick horror story okay so maybe and i'm telling you this because i want everybody to know okay i had a student um at mars hill where i followed denise and I, I cautioned the parents please don't buy an instrument until i can go with you okay well they wanted something under the christmas tree so i won't tell you which online venue they bought it from. It was used and it was from a private party. Okay, so the girl comes back with the instrument. She comes in for her first lesson and she played a scale. So the left hand sounded different from the right hand. So I turned the horn around and I noticed there was no serial number on the bottom. So I picked up the phone number. You know where I'm going with this, right? P picked up the phone, called my friends who make these instruments. And I said, can you tell me, I confirm this for me. And the person said, oh yeah when there's not a serial number on the bottom joint or the top joint, that means it's been replaced. Well, you can't replace a joint on a clarinet like you can a tire on your car because the clarinets are made from one piece of wood. So when you take another piece of wood and put it with an unknown piece of wood, then you get what this young lady had, which was the left hand sounded one way and the right hand, I, I can't even begin to describe you how it sounds. Mm -hmm. And they paid at that time, not a, a ton of money, but it was, a, it's been many years ago, but it's like $1,500, you know? So that's, yeah. 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 I thought you were going to say there were two different brand of instruments. But it was scary. I'd never heard anything like that before. I was shocked actually. <laughs> so so yeah. if you're, at, I'm sorry, go ahead, Kristen. I was just going to say, yeah, anytime you're stepping up, you know, think of it like an investment. You know, even if you're unfamiliar with instruments, look online and read reviews. I mean, that's at least something that you can do. Um, and if you're in a situation where lessons are just not possible, maybe you could contact a local clarinet teacher and just say, can I just have you meet me and help us pick an instrument? You don't necessarily have to teach a lesson to do that. Um, I do that for my students, but you know, when you're a band director, that situation is a little bit different. If, uh, if the band director is available to meet you there, that's fantastic. Um, but I know band director's time is very precious, so it's tough. Yeah, I think you'll find that many clarinet teachers are very willing to help with something like that, especially when we get past COVID and it's easier to make it happen. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, ask for help, never feel bad about doing that. I, I wanted to ask you a question along with this. So you're maybe you're you know some of our band directors are teaching like i was my first year and it was very um economically depressed people just didn't have the money to go buy something new and so kind of what they started on a lot of times was what they went through high school on that was it if, if you have to decide between a different part of the instrument what do you replace what's the order of what you try to upgrade and why maybe 
What do you go with first? Uh, the first thing I do is um, do a quick check of the instrument, have it take it in um, and do a, a PC, which is a playing condition. Mm -hmm. So just make sure it's in playing condition. A couple of pads might need to re be replaced or a couple of things might need to be tweaked. So number one, make sure the instrument's working. But my number one thing is mouthpiece, you know, um, and it seems like we've already talked about that. So just making sure, and I love Diane that you're doing the stock mouthpiece for the first three weeks of methods class. That's genius. Cause then they see it from that side, just how different yeah, it is. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. More people should do that if you're teaching skills class. <laughs> it works. No, I agree. Mouthpiece first. Um, and it goes back to what I said about the clarinets. Not all scales are created equal, you know, with, and there's not much you can do about it. Um, yeah. You just encourage the student to keep working, get them a good mouthpiece and some decent reads and live with it. That's all you can do. So if you have, um, you've got, you've got your student who said, I've got this instrument and they're kind of stuck with it or they're trying it out and they're not able right now during COVID to get some help in picking it out. What are some things that you could tell them to listen for, to know that they have maybe made a better choice than not? That's a good question. I like to start with the 12. I mean, there, many years ago, I don't know how you guys feel about this, but I was told to always check the 12ths. You know, um, because the one thing that you don't want is like if you play a B flat and you add the register key, that the pitch should not be that different between those two notes. If it's way off and you keep going down the scale, it's way off. But with the 12th, when you add the register key, that's a real issue. And so I'm not sure that that, I mean, I, I don't know, do people undercut tone holes? I mean, that's a really bag of stuff I wouldn't want to get into. So if I were looking for an instrument, I'd make sure if I'd try mine, but most of the time that's not an issue. I mean, I think it, I, I don't think I've seen that, but maybe once, and it was an instrument that was bought at the same place that sells blocks of cheese, you know, <laughs> so, you know like you said, so yeah, I, I would check and I would, you know, um, I had a repairman tell me recently pads, um, if you're looking at your instrument, yeah, they do wear out and they need to be replaced. Two things, if you have cork pads, they can get dry and loud and very clicky. Um, so they do need to be replaced occasionally. And then the, the pad, if it's sealing, I had a repairman tell me, you know, Paula, this pad is it's a great pad. Let's not replace it. It looks bad, you know, but um, it's working and it's performing its intended function. So don't replace it. So I would say, um, next thing would be to, to look at the pads. And if you're having difficulty, like if there's something that doesn't respond well and you're having to like push really hard, you know, or really grip the horn with a lot of pressure, um, then that might indicate that there's something wrong with keys or it could be a bent something somewhere. I'm not a very good person to ask about repair. Kristen's going to be a lot better than me. <laughs> Well, my husband's an instrument repairman, so most of the stuff I know is from him. So, happy <laughs> woman. <laughs> but I can I can share a quick trick. Uh, one of the first things that goes out of adjustment is our left B, and it doesn't seal. It doesn't close all the way. So you can check that left B, and then close the pad. It's closing, like you want it to close, and so you close it with your thumb, and then you take your other thumb, and you can push up slightly on that little foot, which is hard to show um, right here. And that's how you can adjust that. But, you know, I would do that with guidance maybe the first time, but that's something I've taught my students to do because it is one of the first things that just, it just kind of wiggles out of adjustment and then you're not able to play that left B. So then they're kind of forced to use a fingering that's not the best in context. Or they develop bad habits by squeezing, trying to force it to play, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think band directors too don't always realize aside from the mouthpiece that the student really can't afford to get a new instrument, which so many of them just can't, especially right now, they can try replacing a barrel and bell. And they can make a, a not so great instrument along with a good mouthpiece sound so much better. You know, so again, I would tell them to, to ask for help in choosing those. There are tons of great options out there that for a lot less money than purchasing an entire new clarinet, they can change the response and the sound, the intonation of the instrument. So there are options if they can't, you know, put the money out there at the time for a new instrument yet. 
Right. And I was going to ask Kristen, your husband's still like doing repair. I know, right? Because like here, you can't talk to the repairman, but you can drop it off, you know, and they'll look at it and then give it back to you. But they like keep the instruments, you know, here. They've been doing it, keeping them for two weeks and letting them sit before they touch them and stuff. So there's a lot of protocols in place right now. Yeah. But you can do. still get repair though. Yeah. They do five days at the shop where he's at. And um, they also have tables set up between the repair window and the people. So there's all this distance and you kind of have to yell across the table, but it's, that's how they're staying safe. Um, Check the lobby. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's continue talking, you know, a little bit on the band director side of things. What's the most important piece of advice you would give to band directors who aren't clarinetists? I've got one. Don't believe everything you hear. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, it's, and it, you, you just got to really get information, uh, from a lot of different sources. And I've got, especially here where equipment is concerned, because, um, there is no quick fix. And we talked about that earlier. Um, private lesson teachers are a great resource and, but don't assume that they may have all this expensive equipment and stuff because they've been doing it a long time. They're grown ups and they've gone through all these different changes. So what works for them or what works for this person that is super famous, um, may not work for your students. Um, so I would say, um, you know, just don't believe everything you hear and, and ask a lot of people for information and then form your own opinion. Yeah. Yeah. The more different people you're able to talk to, then you can kind of come up with the average answer. You yeah. know, if you have just the one person you always go to like, Oh, that's my clarinet guy, or that's my flute person. Then you're getting a very narrow opinion on things. So the more you can branch out, the better. Um, you know, I was only a band director for a couple of years, but, um, remembering that experience and knowing that there are so many instruments in the band that I needed more help with. I just tried to every week have one little trick. I would try to learn like, okay, this is trumpet week. I'm going to try to learn one new thing on trumpet this week that I can help my students with. And I know it's hard to balance because your schedule is crazy, but if you kind of, you can even go and score order in your calendar, like flute week, oboe week, like whatever skill, I'm going to try to learn something and just think of it like you're continuing education. You know, you've got to keep in the know and there may be new techniques or new fingerings or, or new equipment coming out. And that way you just stay informed as much as you can, even if it's just five minutes a week, it, it gives you a little, a little something. That's a great advice. Great Christine. advice. Thinking, thinking back on that, oh, I think one of my biggest pieces of advice would be don't always, don't think that class would wins, skills class, whatever you want to call it, is the last word for the rest of your career. Things change. We all listen and learn new things and try new equipment and get turned on to something new and better. So be open, you know, go to the NEA conferences, go to, you know, those places where you can watch artists who are demonstrating new technique, go try things or have friends that you trust try things. And just don't assume that it's the best because it's the new bright, shiny thing or because it was in your syllabus from class woodlands, right? Yeah. Because you know, it used to be like B45. That was it. That was the mouthpiece we all had to play when I was a kid, right? Well, that's not I the case. Hear that. Yeah, we still do. So yeah, just I still see it. <laughs> and if you've got a clarinet player friends, check in with them. What, what's out there, all right? I'm not a big um, equipment geek or anything. I, I like to find what I like, but I'm also trying to be open to try things so that I know what to tell my students when they come asking me, you know, wh whether they're going to be music educators or just clarinetists who need to know you know, is this something that I should try? Because sometimes it's just something new. That's great. Maybe it's not the best, but just know there's a lot of great stuff out there from all makers, from all brands, all that stuff. There's something for everybody. So you got to find what is good for you and your students to use, whatever that is. <laughs> Along that line, I'd like to say something else about like, um, sometimes there's this mentality, okay, beginners are on two and a half reads, then you know, second year or on three reads and third year, three and a half, like that's not one size fits all either. So you got to listen to your students individually. If they're getting a thin honky kind of sound, then maybe they need to go up in reads or if they're blowing and blowing and they're just blowing their, their brains out and they're, they're getting an airy sound, then their reads too hard. So that's also a very individual thing. I agree with that. I came across many years ago 
um, a gentleman who came up to me after my session, and I won't tell you what state it was in, but anyway, he was real proud of the fact that he said, you know, he said, all that stuff you talked about, about grip and air, he said, that's all real interesting. He said, but I bought, and I'm not going to tell you the name, X, I'll call it X for, for the lack of a, so X, I bought this barrel and I put it on every one of my clarinets instruments and now they don't play flat anymore. <laughs> I, 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 I'm sure my face, I was just like, I'm really, you, you know, and that's the quick fix I'm talking about. Yeah. So it's like Kristen said, he said, you know, you have to have a good sound and pay attention to the reads because and uh, if they're playing on really soft reeds, it could be a disaster. If they're playing on really hard reeds, it could be a disaster too. But there are no quick fixes. Find what's wrong and fix it. Yeah. And there's no correlation between how good a student is and their reed strength. I've had band directors tell me they must be good. They play four. Yeah. <laughs> developing chewing <laughs> and all these bad habits because they're trying to make a popsicle work as a reed. So can you guys talk about the importance of finding that magic appropriateness between the mouthpiece facing and the reed the for band directors what you know what they should know um very generally speaking um and a close mouthpiece is it the close mouthpiece would require a stronger reed and an open mm -hmm. mouthpiece would require a lighter reed you want to um, tell us what you mean by by close and open yeah mm -hmm. the the distance and I, I think that they, they advertise it like the tip openings are like medium, small and whatever. So like we're talking about the distance between the tip of the mouthpiece and the tip of the reed. And then if you slide paper, pardon my little note paper. Oops. My eyes are not as good as they used to be. <laughs> I tried to thread a needle last week. That was a nightmare. I had to use my phone and take a picture and like zoom or something to be able to, anyway, it was really bad. So you can slide a paper and then where it catches, it kind of shows you the, at least the length of the mouthpiece opening. And if it's really up close, then you're gonna want a little bit harder read. And if it's really down low, you'll want a little bit of an easier read. Now that's a really like barbaric way of looking at it. And there's probably better technical terms for all of that. <laughs> Anybody else want to add to that? Oh, I was just, I was just going to say, and again, it's very personal, right? Um, because I was trying a mouthpiece for about a month that was totally different from what I've normally played because I, I thought, well, you know, I'll try this. And I like, kind of like the sound in the, in the lower register. It was nice and rich and so forth, but it, it plays with really soft reeds. So when you get into the upper register, um, it's, real flexible, but it can also be a little bit spread, you know, all of these things. So when you're talking about tip opening, I think it's in mouthpieces and reeds. Again, start with something in the middle and go one way or the other. Um, most people, I don't know if most people, but I went a little bit harder f um, from what I started on. But like Denise said, back in the day, they would start us on these really open tipped mouthpieces where as Kristen so showed you a great example of how, what open means with soft reeds. Um, and those are hard to control, not for everybody, but, but for some people. Um, the other thing that I would suggest you do is look at the suggested reed strength for the mouthpiece that the student has and that you play on yourself. And I wouldn't veer too far away from that because I think when you mismatch a reed, particularly if you have an open tip mouthpiece that needs a soft read at like a two and a half and you put a four on there, that's painful. Yeah. I mean, you know, and there are people that play like that and, oh, you need to play my setup. I was like, no, thank you. You know, because that's one thing that you don't want to have to worry about is, you know, pain when you're trying to play. Um, so it's, it's very personal and you'll just have to try uh, several and find one that that works for every different price. Can be, it should be the, pretty similar for your students as they're developing, but as you get older, the sky's the limit. There's tons of options. As you yeah, know, I, we want a nice clear sound that's not fuzzy and airy, and that doesn't yeah. flat as we ascend into the upper register if they're doing everything else correctly, ambush and voicing lines, right? 
They can articulate well with it. But if they're struggling to get a sound, it's fuzzy, airy, squeaking a lot, it's probably too hard. If it's collapsing and closing off, especially as they go toward that high C, typically it's the reed is just too light and it's sealing off, right? So there's just some general things that the band director can listen for. Right? Somebody on Facebook um, asked, with the popularity of synthetic reeds increasing, do you always start beginners on cane reeds? And, you know, I, I just personally started playing on legeres myself, but I would firmly state that, yes, I would start a student on a cane reed. I just think, I think people need to know what that feels like, how that plays like, how you need to adjust, how you need to learn how to adjust reeds, et cetera, et cetera, before they try synthetic. That's me personally. I, I agree. Um, I mean, I'm experimenting with um, several different models of uh, synthetic reeds right now because the way that I work in here, I always have a clarinet out and I want to be able to just pick it up and play. Um, so it would be a convenience factor for me. Um, but I'm myself, I'm struggling with finding the perfect fit. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think, like Diane said, it's so important to feel what a real reed feels like and how it responds. And then you can branch out, you know, as you get better. Um, but I think it's, it's nice to start on a, a cane reed. Yeah, I agree. So, I, I agree with everything that you said. I'm a dinosaur, so <laughs> gosh, I hate to admit this, but I will. About 20 years ago, when I think it was about that, that, that far back, when Guy Legere started the company, um, I got some of his reads, and they were really fun to play and respond well um, for me. Um, maybe I didn't have the right strength, but as I, if I played on them for a really long time, they got a little warm and the, and I had some little bit of pitch problems, I'm, but that's just me. Um, but I know that they are great options for a lot of people. And I know a lot of professional people who sound amazing play those, but I agree with uh, the other three ladies, um, the cane read, I think you owe it to your student to, you know, they, they really need to start with that and then see if the, the plastic reeds work for them. But the, they're great options, and especially for the low clarinets, mm -hmm. you know, for the big mouthpieces. They've yeah. come so far now, they really have, which is great. They have come a long way. Yeah, I find them really, really easy for like when I'm playing bass clarinet, for some reason, I think that they're just more forgiving. Um, so I have, I'd have some bass clarinet students who have some synthetic reeds and they use them from time to time. Um, because it's nice, especially if you're, you know, doing a concert and you've got to play some B flat and bass and your bass is sitting there cold. It's nice to be able to just have it ready to go. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So um, what is, what's an important piece of advice that you would give to band directors? Oh, we just did that. We just did, did that, that one. Oh my God. I need to <laughs> see that. I'm going to try the next one, Diane. So how do you keep uh, practicing fun and engaging for young players? <laughs> I do duets as soon as possible. Um, that's why I have some in my beginner book, um, du duets. Um, and I also encourage the students to do improv. I don't know if you guys saw, I tracked one of my, my last beginner that I had um, it, all the way through her, her till she graduated. Um, but she had played piano and she had a great work ethic. So she would come in and I encouraged her. I didn't care if the hand position wasn't exactly right because I knew she would practice until she didn't squeak anymore. And she would come in every week and the first um, song that she improvised was for her mother and it just, I almost just cried. It was so adorable. Um, you are my sunshine. And, and she didn't know how to play E flat. So she found a way to close the hole halfway to make an E flat. And, you know, the first, you, oh, I'm going to correct it. No, I said, that's beautiful, Jessica. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's beautiful. So I would let them use their ears and do, and they're, they're going to quickly, once they learn more notes and more music, they're going to want to focus on playing what you do. But in the beginning, it's okay for them to come in and have stuff that's made up, even if you don't recognize it. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Duets and let them improvise. And Paula, what you just said is so important. I think we do some, sometimes we stifle their creativity and their love of playing by got to do it this way, got to do it this yes. way, got to play this. And so yeah. what you did was wonderful because you know you'll be able to come back around and change that behavior, but you 
enable her to share something with you in a positive way. That's, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with that, Paula. I love both those ideas. Duets are great because they start to really develop and match. And, and it's also another way of demonstrating the sound, you know, so that they hear the sound they're trying to aim for. Um, I also, you know, band directors, if band directors are watching, encourage the, the free play in the classroom. I've been in some band rooms where it's just utterly quiet and there's absolutely no warm up allowed until we all warm up together. Um, and if that helps your your brain and your your emotions for the day because you got a lot to deal with, great. But if you can allow some free play, that would be fantastic because it gives them a chance to kind of warm up on their own, fix their read the certain way they need it to be fixed and kind of play around and even goof off a little bit because there's a lot of fun things that are happening during that time. I've had classes where it takes me a second to get to the podium and my students are like someone's on the drums in the back and they're just going crazy and they're all kind of improvising together so if you can encourage that in the classroom in a you know somewhat organized state then that works out nicely um, you got to make sure you have some ground rules for that of course so that nothing gets destroyed but you know, if you've got a responsible class they can do that kind of stuff i've taught some things by rote also um, and that's great for ear training so you can model a tune at the podium and then have them all try to figure it out give them a few minutes to figure it out and then try to play it together. That's a fun thing to do. Um, for my private students, I always ask them like, what's their favorite movie or what's their favorite theme song? And then I'll write it out for them, you know, using some music writing software. And I always make sure it crosses the break in one way or another, especially if they're like a second or third year player, just to reinforce the break. And they're gonna wanna play it because it's their favorite tune. So I do that kind of stuff too. That's great. That was going to be the advice I would say was to give them structure in their practice, but make sure that it always includes something that they want to play just because they love it. Yeah. I think that's true for us too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's why it's so it's so great, you know, both Paula and Kristen, you've you've got stuff out there that's fun to play and yet very pedagogical for young students. So thank you for for providing those resources. Oh yeah. Uh what what do you what do you all enjoy about teaching young players? I love beginners. They are a blank slate and you get to be a part of that beginning experience of them starting to play an instrument and they light up when they figure something out. They're just so excited and so eager. Um, and I, I miss that experience. I started in high school, so I didn't really get the beginning band experience. So I think that's why I like beginners so much because I, I just want to like experience it through them, you know. So I love beginners. They're the best. <laughs> I, I agree. Energy and eager, eagerness. Um, one of the things that encouraged me to um, step out of the traditional role as a music educator and pursue what I've spent most of my life doing is I had out of that class, I think I had two classes of about 40 players at this one middle school. And so the very first uh, clinic that I did was back before most of you were born in 1998. And so I took a quartet um, to as a demonstration group and they were all sixth graders. Um, and I had done an arrangement, a very, you know, short, but all the little melodies from the Barber of Seville. And these girls just had a uh, su superb work ethic. Um, and the first player had only played a year, but she could easily go to D above the staff. Um, and to see the looks on the faces of the people were there, to hear them play and the, and the kids were just having so much fun um, that it, it just, it was amazing to watch. I also sent them out of the room, all four of them, with somebody from a, an audience member who had never touched a clarinet. And I said, they're, you know, they're gonna teach you how to make a sound. And so they did, these sixth graders, they took them out and they took great pride. They pulled up in the door, Miss Corley, he can do it. He can play the F sharp, you know? And so every, it was hysterical to see the adults uh, reaction to that. But I'd forgotten for me how uplifting that was to be able to take the eagerness and the energy and just the innocence, you know, of, of like Kristen said, a blank slate. It's a wonderful thing. And I hope everybody is able to experience it at some point. Oh, if we could bottle that, right? That's, 
thing with me. I just love the joy that they come to the instrument with and the curiosity and the, <clears throat> wow. So I still keep teaching those young students. I just enjoy it so much. I do. Uh, well, how about, we have one more listed question, unless I'm wrong here. What is about the importance of private instruction for young players? Can we talk about that? I wish I'd had lessons. <laughs> I, I mean, I really do. I, I think I had. My mother drove me 60 miles. Um, I did get one lesson when I was a sophomore um, in high school. Um, I think it is really great for students who are ready. Um, I think that you can push students too far. I mean, you have to remi re remind yourself, you know, talk to the student and, and see what is their work ethic. Because if you've played the instrument or, you know, oh, you must take private lessons to be able to do this, that's really not somewhere you want to go, especially these days with all the rhetoric, you know, in schools and, and you have to be very careful. But I think they're great. And I think if the student wants them and will work, that's a, a great thing. But I have told students in the past, high school students who have come to me, um, whose parents were sitting in the room and they didn't practice. And so their parents brought them week after week and they still didn't practice. And so I, I give them a warning and then the third time, that's it. You know, so, and I've dismissed them with the parents sitting there and watched the parents' <laughs> face turn really red. But actually, I did them a really good big favor because the kid's not doing anything and doesn't want the lessons, and they're paying the money because they want to be good, supportive parents. Well, they're not doing the student any favors. So, yes, lessons are great um, for, the, for the right student who's ready to do them, absolutely. Yeah, lessons are... are um... A wonderful I call it a supplement to band because you are learning a lot in your band you're learning something every day in your band class you're going to learn from the person sitting next to you in your band class so there is a lot of instruction going on so a private lesson is a supplement to that um, and it can push you in different ways it can also help catch fundamental things that need to be focused on if you've got a little bit of a flaw here or there to kind of tweak that and like Paula said, it's really good for the students who are motivated and ready for that step. So um, the, way, the way I think about lessons is I think it's really, really critical at the very, very beginning. So even if you set up like two or three private lessons before your student is a band beginner, that's a great thing to do. Just like have a few private lessons before band starts and then they get on to a really good start when they start band. And then after a year or two, if they really start to get into it and it becomes their thing, because, you know, it takes kids a while to figure out what their thing's going to be. They usually have it figured out by the time they're in eighth grade, if that's going to be their thing. They're just going to stay in band. That's my thing. I want to be competitive. I want to play a solo. And those are the kinds of kids, if they're wanting to try out for honor bands and play solos and, you know, do, do things like that, they're really ready for lessons. Good. All good points. Well, ladies, do you guys have any parting words? Parting words, parting, parting advice. <laughs> oh, wow. <sighs> this has been great. Thank you for having me. And yeah, thank you. Kristen feels the same way. <laughs> um, and it's always great to share ideas. And I would say to everybody out there, uh, never stop learning. And, and to keep your mind open to new ideas. I yesterday had a new edition of the Mozart on my stand and I'm very intrigued um, with this new edition and I'm gonna make some changes in the way that I have played it over the last 500 years, you know, <laughs> because of this new edition. So I, I would say, you know, just never stop seeking information. Always try to put yourself in the place of your students Great. to get a good perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have, you have to constantly be learning. It, it can be easy to say, okay, I've reached this point, And so I'm done. I'm just going to do what I do and then just check it off my list. But um, you do yourself and your students a disservice when you do that. And I've come to that terms for myself too. I've, I've noticed years where I get a little lazy and it's like, okay, I need to branch out. I need to watch a masterclass. I need to go to a concert. I need to stay inspired somehow. So make sure you're staying inspired for yourself, like whatever instrument you play, like make sure you're inspired as a musician because it's hard to impart that inspiration to others if you're lacking it yourself. 
so yeah, important. for sure. Yeah, I, I I always tell myself if if I feel like I don't have anything left to learn, it's time for me to quit. Um, <laughs> you know, because I I want to keep learning. I mean, I learn from my students all the time. But you know, there are so many amazing resources out there now that that young students can 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 view, you know, either with their parents help through the internet, um, or, you know, there's so much online, right. And I, and again, I know young students maybe can't get online, but their parents can, um, and monitor some things. Um, there's amazing resource books out there, um, you know, that, that people should have in their libraries. Um, we also have, you know, I'm going to plug the ICA, the International Clarinet Association, you know, for $10, um there's a youth membership and it's amazing you can access our journal you can access so many things online um that would be so helpful for you and band directors out there so you know just just keep on keep on searching yeah. i'd say also just be humble don't be afraid to say that you don't know something none of us knows everything nobody does and I think our students respect us more when we say, you know, I don't know the answer, but I know somebody who does, and I'll get back to you with that. And then go find out, because they're going to remember what we've, we've told them. So if we teach them incorrectly, they're going to remember that. Um, that's going to be something they have to relearn later. Um, so I would say, do your best. We can't all know everything. Do your best to get the help where you need it. There's so many great resources. I'm so glad that Diane mentioned the ICA. We're trying to do more and more things for young players and for teachers now. So stay tuned for that. There's some cool stuff coming. But uh, yeah, such great wisdom, ladies. I'm so honored to, to be here talking with all of you who do such great work. So thank thank you. you. This was really, really wonderful. And I, I loved watching it. I'm probably going to watch it again and take some notes. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having us. And this is such an important level to talk about because I, uh, we've done all done a lot of pandemic contemplation, right? right? And so as we were talking before this started, um, our young people, we've got to focus on them because that's where we're going to keep the fires burning for the arts. You know, yeah. it's going to happen at the youngest levels. And we're going to have to make some changes in the way we view it, in the way we teach it, in the way we think about music um, in order to make that happen. But it's going to happen. It will. Uh -huh. Well, thank you, ladies. This is a wonderful way to end our weekend. Um, Denise and I thank all of you and all of the participants that we've had and our guests throughout the entire weekend. And we obviously couldn't have done it without you. And we all we have learned so much and uh, we're inspired. So thank you so much. Thank you. Well, great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Everybody, everybody stay safe and well and keep on practicing. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for joining us.